Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. Today is another Tuesday Takedown. Never of people, just of bad ideas, bad arguments, and bad apologetics. And today I'm gonna to play you a really quick clip between George Janko and the Tony Robbins. Now, this clip comes from an over two and a half hour conversation that these two men had together. And this is the intro that George chose to put for the video. So I don't think I'm taking anything out of context. I'm not just cherry picking what I want here. This is obviously a highlight that he saw in their conversation, and I wanna to respond to it. And by the way, once again, of course, this is not about George, and this is not even about Tony Robbins. Love him or hate him, believe in his motivational, positive thinking message or not, doesn't matter. It doesn't pertain at all to this particular video. But what this video is, is I believe Tony Robbins straw manning very strongly the problem of evil and suffering, and George just nodding along and being excited about it. And to assist me in this conversation of evil and suffering, I'm going to put these four live counters up on the screen. Many of you can probably guess what they are counting to, but we are going to touch on them at the very end of this video. So stay tuned for that. And let's go ahead and start by watching the clip. Well, what, what if you're God and you come here to this incredible place you created called planet Earth and you walk up to one of your creations and you say, hey, creation, how are you liking this thing I created for you? And the person says, God, I'm glad you showed up because I got a bone to pick with you. First of all, why do you make it so effing hot all the time? And then you make these stupid people that get in my way and interfere with what I'm trying to accomplish. Why wouldn't you make everybody nice and connected? You make these little red ants, they bite my ass. I mean, why would you create such a thing if you're God? And then God goes to one of his other creations and says, how are you liking this place? And they say, oh God, thank God you're here. This, I've always wanted to thank you directly. This is the most amazing paradise. It's so unbelievable. First of all, you never get bored because you're always changing the temperature. It's so amazing. You bring so many people to challenge me to grow. And you made these little red ants. Man, these things are courageous. They're one millionth my size and they bite my It's amazing. You know. Now the question is, if you were God, who do you want to hang out with? The first person or the second one? Wow. <laughs> so I tell people, say, there is no God. I said, there's God. You're just so much. I just want to hang out with you. <laughs> All right. So we have a lot to go through here. And I want to address the very first thing he says. It's not the main part of what I want to cover today. So we're just going to kind of address it and then put it on a shelf. But it's something that I have to point out here. In this hypothetical thought experiment, Tony is giving two individuals that are having a very different reaction to God's creation and using three different examples from God's creation. And supposedly that's going to depend on if this God wants to communicate with us in general. This is problematic for a thousand reasons. But the very first thing that is said here in this, again, setting up the hypothetical is God is checking in with his creation and says, hey, how do you like this thing that I made for you? That's Problem number one. One of my biggest gripes about Christianity is the emphasis on feeling and specifically making everything about us. Even if it's selflessly somehow about us as a species and not totally selfishly like us as an individual, it's still completely ignorant. Again, I owe you guys, I've been talking about this video for a long time. I wanna do a video about zooming out and really getting some correct perspective on the entire universe before zooming all the way into our particular local area of the universe and our particular solar system and our particular planet and within this planet, this particular time frame, and within this time frame, us as a particular species, ignoring the past, ignoring everything else that has evolved right alongside us and thinking that we are indeed so special. No, we are not, but Christians love to do this. They make this about themselves. We are here. We are the top of the chain. Look, God gave all of this for us, for us to use like the animals, for us to consume, for us to find beautiful, for us to appreciate, etc. No, it's not even biblically accurate. God did not create this for us. Everything God has ever done, and this is abundantly clear in so many scriptures, is for him. He made us to bring glory and worship to him. And as a backup plan, he even has the inanimate objects of the earth, like the rocks, ready to cry out to him because he demands praise. His essence and being is so perfect and full of glory that he can't stand to be without being reminded of it. He did not make anything for us. He didn't make anything at all. But insofar as the story goes, what a ridiculous concept that Christians have made themselves so special. So that's problem number one. We can set it aside now. I understand not the crux of the video. Let's get into these three examples here. So again, I'm saying that he is straw manning the problem of evil and suffering because he's focusing on three things as if this would actually be the three things that someone would bring up to God. God really comes down. You really decide you're going to have a bone to pick with this God. And then you list these three examples 
Come on, Tony. No one in their right mind is talking about, it's a bit too hot. These little bugs are annoying. Maybe, yes, maybe people talk about how we're not all nice and connected, but the way he's framing that second one was more, oh, people are stupid, they're annoying, they're getting in my way. If these are all the gripes that you actually have with God, these are the things that would come out of your mouth first, you live the most privileged life of anyone that has ever existed in human history, and congratulations. But that's why I call it a straw man of the problem of evil and suffering, because this is not the problem that people like myself have with this particular God and the evil and harm and suffering that exist in the world. But just for fun, let's actually go through these three examples first before we get to some of the other major issues. Gripe number one is that it's so hot. Now, person number two enjoys the heat or enjoys the temperature fluctuations because this way they never get bored. If I were trying to understand this and be as nice as possible to Tony, I would say that yes, there are people that don't want to live in certain areas of the earth when they have the privilege to choose where they live because they like seasons. They want snow at Christmas. They like the hot days of summer when they can get out the lemonade but that's a preference. And for all the people of the world that live in places with very consistent temperatures, I don't think that they're all just dying of boredom. Again, what a very myopic little vision here of a problem. But here's the reality of temperature changes on this planet. 166,000 people die of extreme temperatures every single year. That stat comes from the World Health Organization. By the way, I have stats for everything I'm gonna list today, and I'll try to put them in the description of the video. But those deaths are just from exposure. That has nothing to do with all of the other ways that weather kills us. That doesn't include storms, that doesn't include floods, that doesn't include drought, that doesn't include what leads to famine, or any other weather-related event. We're talking extra hundreds of thousands, if not millions of deaths, because it gets too hot or too cold. Tell me again that this is designed for us. And again, not to attack Tony as an individual, but with his reach and the amount of people that he has actually helped and had conversations with and seen their life, to take this ignorant of a perspective is just ridiculous. So back to person one, they now have their second complaint for this creator, and they are upset about all of the ignorant people around them, the annoying people, the people who get in their way. Why can't everyone be nice and connected? Which, by the way, I think is a perfectly valid complaint. God why didn't you make us as a species to be people who could get along with each other better? And you can give free will excuses all day long, but however you believe that there's free will on this planet, God still made us with certain capabilities. I saw in the comments the other day a great thing. We can't change the color of our skin to say blue. That's just not something that we can do. That doesn't take away from our free will. It's just a limitation that this God, if he were real and actually created us, would have put in from the get-go. Why not create a limitation where we just don't hurt children? It never crosses our mind. No one is ever attracted sexually to minors, ever. It just can't happen. Do you know what an improvement in this world that would be? Was it too hard for this God? He puts limitations, like already acknowledge that. He just didn't put these that would actually be so useful in preventing a mass amount of harm and suffering. So to this imaginary person's point, yes, why not make us as a species that is more connected and kind to one another? But don't worry, because person number two has this argument licked. Well... If I didn't have people like that in my life, I wouldn't be able to personally grow. It's only when someone annoys me that I get to practice patience. And by the way, I understand this general line of thinking, but to think it's the only way that God could have created us to be able to grow or that growing needed to be necessary, I don't think that it outweighs all of the harm that happens from being in a system where all these other detrimental things occur. But what about just positive growth? What about having a mentor that takes you from good to great? What about higher education, constructive conversations, and so many other things that still allow people to grow without having to go through horrific events or deal with terrible people. Also, this is just kind of a way of normalizing and justifying toxic behavior. Oh, it's good. It's good. It's totally fine. Because for me, if I'm already in the position where I am in control of my faculties enough and my life is going good enough that I can see it as a fun challenge to help me grow, then it's okay. Completely dismissing the actual behavior, its effect on society at large, the individual who's acting out that way. Let's say you have someone who's just kind of slow and 
front of you. They're not super self-aware. They're not getting out of your way fast enough for you to exit the store. And so you have to practice this patience. Oh, it's so good. What about that person's life? Do you think that they wanted to be that unaware? Do you think they wanted to be slow? Do you think they wanted to be inconsiderate? They're a product of their nature and nurture. And I don't want to take all personal responsibility away from them, but just saying that it's okay that these people exist and it's good for me is missing the value of their life. And again, the value of society at large. What a ridiculous thing. So let's move on to the third and even sillier example that Tony gives. Person number one, he's all charged up from the first two arguments. He's going to give his third complaint to God, and it's about the ants. It's about the little red ants that bite and annoy. That's what they were going to discuss with God. Not the person in their family who died of cancer, not the starving children, not the slaves, not the fact that there's psychopaths in the world. Nope. It's the little red ants. And person number two, once again, don't you worry, they've got this handled. They are going to have a shift in their perspective. They're going to see these ants so small, but so courageous. Look, Doesn't this show us that God is awesome, that he would make something that is brave enough to attack a giant? What? First of all, these ants are acting strictly out of instinct. They are not whatsoever being courageous. We are personifying them because we do that with everything. And if I'm wrong and we find out someday that these ants are operating in a higher level of understanding of their world around them and they're actually making a mental choice to go up against something so much bigger than them because they have something that equates bravery or courage, fine, still does not excuse the fact that God creates all of these pests and all of these harmful animals in the world just so we can be in awe of their courage. What a joke. Let me give you some real stats about animals. Maybe person one, instead of complaining about the little red ant, should have talked about the mosquito, the number one killer of people when we're talking about dying from some kind of an animal. The minimum stats that I saw on this were 608,000 upwards of 1 million deaths per year by malaria from just mosquitoes alone. Well, snakes kill between 50,000 and 100,000 people a year. Dogs, man's best friend, kills 25,000 people a year. Lots of them children, lots of them viciously, and lots of them through giving rabies, which is a horror of a way to die. That might be something to take up with God, not the innocent little sting and annoyance of the little red ant. However you frame it, millions of people per year literally lose their life because of the animal kingdom that is a part of supposedly God's creation and how he ordered them, behaved them, allowed them to interact in the world, the diseases that they could carry, the difficulty that we would have in figuring and curing those diseases, etc. Like, come on, real problems. What a straw man this has been. Now, I also want to take the time to point out that if this was just Tony Robbins on his motivational platform saying, you know what, guys, the world sucks as it is, and we need to change the world, but in the meantime, we also need to change how we think about the world, because we're not going to get anywhere just being pissed off and annoyed all the time. So let me give you these little examples about common day occurrences that are indeed annoying and how we can think about them differently. And fine, if that's a tool for you to be able to change your thinking and your perspective, to be able to act more positively in the world, wonderful. I couldn't agree more. But that's not the claim that is being made. The claim is that this God actually made these things and that these things that we perceive as negative in our lowly state are actually beneficial if we can be the right kind of person to see the silver linings. And then and only then will God want to be with us. How asinine, how absolutely insulting. And that's one of the biggest crux, other than the horrendous spectacle that he's making here of the problem, the real problem of evil and suffering in the world. It's this last statement that just does me in. Now, the question is, if you were God, who do you want to hang out with, the first person or the second one? Wow. (laughs) So I tell people, say, there is no God. I said, there's God. He's just so much, he doesn't want to hang out with you. (laughs) Now, I get that he's being a little bit tongue-in-cheek here. He's not actually saying that God is choosing to hide himself from everyone who can't view his creation in the correct and positive light. But to some degree, however silly this is or however far he has stretched this metaphor, he is trying to say that it is up to us and our attitude and how we perceive the world that will dictate our acceptance or allowance of God's presence in our life. Once again, this is from a ridiculous position of privilege to not understand that so many people in the world 
are in such dire straits that they simply cannot have the wherewithal. They cannot have the perspective. Their problems are too real. Their sorrow is too great to tell God, thumbs up, bro. Thanks for making the temperature changes. The vast majority of everyone who has ever lived has had to just focus on existing, not thriving. Where one little slip in their life breaks the ankle and allows them to not continue on and they're left for dead. Where one little cut before our understanding of bacteria gets infected and kills them. Where more people died of gum disease and dental hygiene issues. Where it was so hard to ever find clean water that one of the biggest killers in history has been dysentery, death by diarrhea. Where you are at the mercy of two of the things he listed here actually, the weather and animal life, for whether your crops are going to be able to sustain your family or if you're all going to die of starvation this coming winter. Because thanks to temperature change, you also can't just just have a thriving system year round. You have to store up and save for yourself to get through the parts of the year where you can't grow things to eat. Again, I could go on forever, and this video is not going to be my magnum opus on the problem of evil and suffering. We are going to do a humongous deep dive. This is a preview, and yet hopefully it is enough to really accurately represent what these two are laughing about as if it's nothing. It really is appalling. So the last thing that I want to point out here is also just how untrue and unfair this is by way of asking you to really think if you're a believer, would you want these three things in heaven, annoying and inconsiderate people, pesky insects that are biting you, and temperature changes that are way too hot or way too cold? Is that what you expect paradise to be like, really? If you woke up in heaven, would you not be slightly disappointed that these things existed? Do you think that they existed in the Garden of Eden? If you don't think they're going to be in heaven, and you don't think that they were the original plan in the garden, then it's obviously so ridiculous to have person two here say, look at what a paradise you've made. It's not a paradise to have these things. And even though these three examples are so silly and little, you wouldn't even want them in your version of paradise. No one would. No one has ever written out, here's what I think heaven will be like, and it will have to have really hot days so I cannot be bored. It will have to have little animals that bite me so I can be amazed at their courage, and it will have to have annoying and inconsiderate people so I can continue to challenge myself on my personal growth. No one in the history of time has ever conceived of that as paradise, period. So you, after the fact, looking at our current world and trying to give credit to God for his amazing creation by attributing it to paradise with these lame excuses and this denial of reality is simply inexcusable. How ignorant, how arrogant. So this is going to be a super quick video. I just wanted to throw all this out here and reply to this. In terms of these four numbers on the screen, this here is the live counter. And by the way, we're only in January of how many people have starved to death this year. This one is how many people have been murdered. This one is how many children have died of something preventable. And then this one is how many people continue to be born, specifically our population growth. This is including the losses of deaths. So all this is happening. And yet this God keeps cranking out babies. If we do believe in God's sovereignty, in the plan for every every child that he has, in the inherent dignity of every single human. He's just continuing to spit them out at this rate, knowing that this is the reality of his perfect creation. He should be embarrassed, not because he made something that's so capable of sinning, which is also his problem, but that he made something so very weak and fallible and yet also created beings that were able to receive and process and feel the lack of perfection. And I'll just never understand, how can Christians have this both ways? Ah, oh, look at the creation, it points to God, what a perfect designer, look, intelligent design is so obvious. While at the same time talking about how lowly we are, how awful we are, how terrible we are, our sinful nature from birth, that we deserve nothing but death and hell, aren't we also part of God's creation? Where's our perfection? Oh, well, we are the exception because the devil got a hold of us. Oh, okay, so God also created created a perfect world, but then literally his actual enemy, he gave dominion over it. That makes perfect sense, except that it doesn't because it's not perfect because none of this is perfect because it's stupid. Honestly, the story is dumb. The excuses are dumb and we're not stuck with them. We can do better. You guys need myths. You think that we need a God to have centered morality? Fine. Make up a better myth then. One that's not intrinsically harmful. One that doesn't make one hate themselves or deny themselves just to worship a narcissist. Anyways, I digress.
I hope you were able to pick up what I was putting down. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you Thursday to cover Jonah. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tiers of support, my iconoclast and GVI, Jacob, Joe, Martin, Oliver, Perry, Rocket, and Sean, my humanist heroes, Jared and Christy, my atheist advocates, Caleb, Sparky, Stephanie, and Todd, as well as all of my secular scholar patrons. If you believe in the mission of this channel or you simply enjoy its content, please consider joining these fine people. Thanks and have a great day.